Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. I'm going to get down on my knees. You can get down on your knees. You can sit. Just let's put our hearts on the Lord tonight. And let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, grateful that you've chosen us to be in this place in this time, God. What a privilege that we get to live in this land. God, that we can freely come into the house of God, that we can carry the Bible, Lord, that we have options of translations. God, to have the word of God in our lap, even in our pocket, God, on a smartphone, Lord. And Father, we don't want to take that for granted. God, we just want to take some time right now and say thank you. Lord, thank you for our nation, God. We've already lifted up our our leaders and, and our land, God, and we do reiterate those prayers, God. We thank you, Father God, that you give us godly leaders. Turn the heart of the king towards righteousness, God. In our land, God, and around the world, Lord. And Father, tonight as we open up your word, you are the sovereign king. God, we acknowledge you above all else. Tonight we didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, or any other color, God. We came to hear from you. Holy Spirit, come. Be our teacher. Be our guide. You're welcome in this place. Have your way in us. Speak things, God, that I didn't even say tonight, Lord. May the word just come alive on the inside of each and every one of us. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, the instruction, even the correction that we need for our lives, Lord. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for our brothers and sisters around the world, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. God, that are preaching the gospel, we bless them, Lord. There are brothers and sisters at no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else. But we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, Amen. Amen. You can have a seat tonight. I've titled the message, American Pride. You know, Fourth of July is a couple days away. And I've had a word on my heart about pride for a while, but tonight I wanted to talk about what it means to us as Americans. Many people today say that they are proud to be an American. Now, I understand the sentiment, okay? And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, I myself have said I'm proud to be an American. I'm glad that the Lord uh, planted me in this land. I'm, I'm very happy that I get to be a part of this nation. In fact, I, I, I've traveled the world. I do believe that America is the greatest nation on the planet. That's just me personally, okay? And, and me personally as well. I've, I've traveled all over. I've gone coast to coast, border to border. I, I've traveled around the world. And I think California, even with its smog and its problems, is still the greatest place on the planet to live. So anyways, live stream people, I'm sorry. I love you all. You probably really love where you live too. You just don't know what's going on here. Can can anybody say amen to that? I mean, come on now. It's just crazy that you could be in the mountains and then, you know, drive down to the beach. It's just nuts where we live. It's, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. And I'm very blessed to live here. I'm very blessed to be here in the Inland Empire as well. And, and, and sincerely, I'm grateful to God for what he's given us. Now, I could say that I'm proud to be an American and, and use the terminology, but I want to kind of flip some things because I, I think that we're innocently saying something that we don't really mean. See, because I I search the Bible, and as I read through the Bible, I I take a look at the heartbeat of God, not just what God is saying on the surface. What is the passion of God? What is the heartbeat of God? What's what's the the behind-the-scenes story? What's really going on on the inside of God? Because God can speak something, and without the passion, without the heartbeat, without the character of God, without really getting there and seeking God's face. See, I could say, I love you, and if you never saw my face when I said, I love you, if I said, I love you like this, I love you. You know, that that would be one thing. But if you saw me look like this, I love you. That'd be a totally different meaning, right? So in the word of God, you can read through the pages and you can catch what God is saying without understanding what God is saying. Anybody know what I mean when I say that? Clear as mud? All right, praise the Lord. Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible do I ever, ever, ever find God saying that we are to be proud Never do I find God saying we need to be proud of ourselves, proud of our accomplishments, proud of our families, proud of our nationality, or proud of our land. I never see God saying that he's proud of us. Never. And maybe in some of your newer translations, you can find that, you know, it says that, but then go ahead and look up the original language and see what's really being said. 
Because as I searched through the Bible, and today I did one of those internet word searches where it pulls up every verse in the Bible that uses the word pride or proud, and I read every last one of them. And in two, the two translations, not just one, in the two translations I looked through today, I could not find one use of the word proud or pride that shed a good light on the, those words. And yet we say, you know, I've got, you know, American pride, or I've got, you know, Latino pride, or, you know, this pride, black pride. You know, even in our land today, there's people shouting gay pride. See, when you, when you start to level these things up against each other, all of a sudden they don't look so attractive anymore, do they? And yet, we want to tell our children we're proud of them. And we want them to feel like we love them. But never in the Bible, again, and, and I'm not trying to be petty. I'm not trying to play the semantics game where we're, we're arguing over words or anything like that. And I know the value that I, I've received from people that have said they are proud of me, and I understand the sentiment. I'm not trying to be petty. Please don't walk out of this place tonight and say, Pastor Dan, so we shouldn't say that we're proud of anybody. No, go ahead and express your heart, and if those words come out, that's fine. Because I know that there's a different meaning to what you're saying. And again, the heartbeat behind it is what God is interested in. He's not so interested in the exteriors. But as I look through the word, God never said he was proud of Jesus. And if anyone had a reason to be proud, it would be God, the father of Jesus, his son. And yet, when Jesus walks in obedience, when he's baptized there in the Jordan, the, the sky splits open, the heavens are rent, the voice of God comes booming forth as the, the, dove is the, the spirit of God is descending like a dove on Jesus, and the voice of God speaks and says, this is my son, I'm really proud of him? No. What does he say? He says, with whom I am well pleased. As I was thinking about this and praying about this, I told my wife, I said, I think I'm going to not tell the boys or my girl that I'm proud of them. I think I'm going to tell them when they do something good, I'm pleased with them. And at first, my wife had a little bit of a problem. With that. She said, well, they still need to know that you're proud of them. I said, I, I think they will. But I think if I do what God does, then I'll get the results that God wants for my life. So I tested it out a little bit. One of my boys came in, and he was helping out. He was cleaning up, and I pulled him in, gave him a big hug and a kiss on the cheek, and I said, hey, bub, because I call him bub. And I said, hey, bub, that pleases daddy when you do that. Big old smile on his face. I mean, his heart leapt. The kid was just excited. You know what he's doing? Running around trying to find more stuff that pleased daddy. <laughs> yes. It works. But I believe that God wants us to follow in his footsteps. God wants us to live a life that makes him proud. No, that is well-pleasing in his sight. Without faith, it's impossible to make God proud. No, to please God. Finding out what is pleasing to the Lord. The, the prosperity of God's servants pleases God. See, God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. God is not proud. God is not haughty. God is not arrogant. And in our lives, I believe that we need to get a hold of this concept. Because I believe that a lot of what our nation is going through is because we are proud in the negative sense of the word. A lot of what our nation is going through, and mark my words tonight, I'm not a prophet, I'm a pastor. But I believe that if you look down the road, if we continue in pride, we're going to end up in a very sad place as a nation. I don't want to be a doomsday sayer or anything like that, but the word of God will come to pass, positive or negative. The choice is ours. And we need to take a look at what the Word of God has to say because Proverbs 16, 5 says this, everyone proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though they join forces, none will go unpunished. And when I look at that as a nation saying that we're proud of who we are, I understand the sentiment, but at the same time, I think, my God, is that the path that we're on? Are we actually fighting against the Lord because now the proud heart has been lifted up? See, according to the Bible, with pride comes shame, comes arguments, and eventually, you know the verse, pride comes before a great fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. Now, we have a couple definitions that we've used at this church of pride. Pastor Deborah said it like this, pride is independent, selfish desires. See that up on the overhead. Pride is independent, selfish desires. See, when we start to get lifted up in pride, it's independent of God, independent of others, and it's directed at self. It's focused on the almighty trinity that we've set up as me, myself, and I, right? That unholy trinity. 
independent, selfish desires. And Pastor Jim stated it like this, pride is self-exaltation, while humility is God-exaltation. We'll see that as we go through the message tonight. Pride is self-exaltation. In other words, when, when we're using terms like I and me and look at here and, and the desires for us to be elevated, that's self-exaltation, that's pride. But humility is, look what God did. Look what God set up. Look how God came through. Look what, look what God is doing in my life. Look how much God came through. Look what, what strength God gave, what provision God gave. Look how, how God just made a way. That's humility is when we start to exalt God. Now, a couple of statements I'm going to make tonight. We're going to take a look at some verses. First statement is this. Pride comes from within and defiles us. If we can look for where is the root of pride, it comes from inside of us. Jesus made this statement in Mark chapter 7. You want to turn there with me? Mark chapter 7. And in Mark chapter number 7, verse number 21 through verse number 23, we read Jesus speaking. They're talking about foods and that sort of a thing. Jesus said, what comes out of a man that defiles a man? Verse 21, Mark chapter 7, verse 21. For from within, out of the heart. Everybody say, out of the heart. heart. See, this is a matter of the heart. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, and evil eye, blasphemy. And what's that next word? Pride. Out of the heart comes pride And then the next word, I believe, is tied to it, foolishness. Verse 23, all these evil things come from within and defile a man. If we allow pride to start in the heart. See, and that's why, and can I I just be open and transparent with you guys tonight? This is something that me, as a Christian, as, as as a man, I deal with this. I have dealt with it from the time I was young. I was that kid that everybody was annoyed with because he was teacher's pet and wanted everybody to know how cool he was, right? I thank God presently that God gave me a wife who is not as impressed with me as I am with myself at times, okay? (laughs) Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Thank God for that woman because she helps me to stay humble and she tells me, you, boy, you ain't all that in a bag of chips. You ain't even the bag, you know? So I'm like, geez, okay, all right. But I thank God for her because why? Because she oftentimes shows me, she's like the mirror showing me, hey, look at, look at, you know, look look at yourself for a second. Take a look at what's going on. What is that inside of you? And I say, yeah, you're right, you're right. But pride comes from within, and we gotta check our hearts. We gotta take a look at our motivations. What is it internally that makes us want to be seen? What is it that, 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 that wants to be lifted up in that way. Why do we have to force ourselves? See, it's independent, selfish desires. It's about us. So we got to take a look inside and say, okay, God, is there something going on inside the heart that I need to take care of? Is there something I need to do to somewhere I need to change? God, what can I do to this heart? God, change the desires of my heart. Lord, help me. And God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, will come inside and reveal those things and start making the changes. Here's another statement for tonight. Pride deceives us and blocks God out of our thoughts. You can actually find I don't have time for all the scriptures tonight that we could have gone into, but pride actually deceives us. As we get lifted up in pride, we start to believe our own press. You know what I mean by that? You know, it's like the the people, oh, I, I don't know if I should go there with this. You think I should? Yeah? You guys are so bad. Have you ever seen people that, that do like five selfies a day? Right? And you're kind of like, are you really into that? You know? Uh, Are you putting that out there for everyone else? I I, I don't know. I just wonder about that. Man, they must really like themselves to take that many selfies. And normally there's not a crowd of people around them. I don't, I don't, maybe there's something to that. But in any event... We, we get ourselves infatuated with, with our own self. We start to believe our own press. I'm the strongest. I'm the best. I'm the biggest. I'm the baddest. And we start to get deceived. And, and, and then eventually it blocks God out of our thoughts. Because when you start taking a look at yourself, you're no longer looking at God. Is that right? Because what you focus on the longest becomes strongest. And therefore, if you're getting your eyes off of Jesus and getting your eyes on yourself, you've got your eyes on the wrong thing. Is that true? 
Let's take a look at it in the Word. Psalms 10, verse number 4. The wicked is proud in his countenance, does not seek God. Look at this. God is in none of his thoughts. Why? Because he's full of himself. And that is wicked. What is wickedness? It is anything that is contrary to the will and way of God. When we start getting our eyes off of God and get it onto ourselves, that is now wicked. And God is now not in any of our thoughts. One of the fruits of pride, if you have a, a root, right, you can trace it out and find out what the fruit of it is. One of the fruits of pride is the desire to be right or to be heard and to be respected, right? I know this is oftentimes the case with myself. I am right. You know, and we have an argument in the house. I'm the man. And you got to put your fist down or stomp your foot or something like that and make yourself feel even more, you know, big or weighty or whatever it is. It's the desire to be right. It's the desire to be heard and to be respected. Sometimes it's not even about the argument. Is that right? It's more about your pride. And you're wanting to be heard more than you are wanting to even be to be right at that point, and also to be respected. Sometimes, you know, in, in our culture, we want to be respected. It's about what we've accomplished, what we've done. And you better respect me because, you know, I got the education to do this, or I, I've got the tenure to do it. You know, I, I've been around longer than you have, young pup, right? And, and, and we start getting this, this thing built up on the inside of us. And, and that's going to block us and block God out of our thoughts and out of our lives. See, we may indeed be right, we may be heard, we may be respected, but pride always wants more. That's why it's the snare of the devil. It's like a fire that eats but is never satisfied. It's continually eating away at our lives, always wanting more. See, because that one level of respect will only go so far because someone else will come along that's more respected than we are. And all of a sudden, I've got to have more respect than that person. Or we'll attain to a certain level, we'll get this degree, or we'll get this amount of money, or we'll achieve this goal. But pride is always eating away at us on the inside. Remember, this comes from within. And there's going to be a void in your heart, and you're going to continue to lift yourself up in pride. Why? Because I have to do more. I have to be noticed. I have to be heard. I have to be respected. I have to be better. I, 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 I. Brings us to the next one. Pride looks only at the present selfish desire impatiently. See, as you continue to go down this road, it starts in the heart, deceives us in our minds, blocks God out of our thoughts, now starts looking only at present selfish desire impatiently. All of a sudden, it's not good enough. No, but it's also not fast enough. It's not, not ever going to be enough. It's that fire that keeps eating away. Proverbs chapter 28, verse number 25. He who is of a proud heart stirs up strife, but he who, look at this, trust in the Lord will be prospered. Notice the difference. See, pride says I got to have it now, and it goes and stirs it up, and it fights, and, and, and it bickers, and it complains, it backbites, it gossips. Why did they get the promotion? I should have got the promotion. I'm way better. Than, you know what? I'm going to go and give them a piece of my mind. And, and all of a sudden, we're walking into an argument. We're stirring up strife, stirring up conflict. But look at this. He who trusts in the Lord will be prospered. Amen. That means you can kick back. You can rest. You can wait patiently. You don't have to tell anyone about your accolades or your accomplishments. You just let the Lord do that for you. And God will bring you to the forefront. God will take care of you. God will make it happen. God will do it in his time, in his way. And guess what? It'll be the right way. And there won't be people in your wake that are hurting. It was the start of a clap. Can I clap now, Pastor? We can. It's all good. Which brings us to the next thing. Pride is not from faith. It hinders blessing. Pride is not from faith and hinders blessing. See, the Bible tells us everything that does not come from faith is sin. Romans chapter 14, verse number 23 at the end of the verse. So pride is not walking in faith. If you think that you can be faith-filled and prideful, mm -mm, you can only be full of one thing, either faith or pride. One will cancel out the other. So you can either cross over into faith and believe God for it, trust in the Lord, just wait on God, right? Put it in his hands, in his timing, in his care, in his way, or you can go the way of pride. 
But look at this. Pride is not from faith and therefore hinders blessing because everything that does not come from faith is sin. And if God blesses you in sin, you will stay in sin. The plain and simple truth. Very familiar verse. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse number 4. Usually we quote the end of this verse, but take a look at the beginning of the verse. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse number 4. Behold the proud. In other words, look and see. Take a look tonight as we talk. Remember, we started this talking about our nation and how we're proud to be an American. Listen, I am not proud of anything any longer when I look at the word and I see verses like this. Take a look and see at the proud. His soul is not upright in him. Now, remember, we're three-part beings. We're body, right? We are spirit. That's the part of us that's born again. And then we are soul. That's our mind, our will, our emotions, our feelings. And something ain't right up here with the proud is what the Bible's saying. Something has gone wrong. We're deceived. But, or in other words, contrast with this, the just shall live by his faith. See, the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. When we are in pride, there's always going to be in the back of our mind that concern. I'm saying I'm tough, but am I tough enough? I'm saying I'm wealthy, but am I rich enough? I'm saying I'm smart, but am I smart enough? I'm saying I'm cool, but am I cool enough? See? And, and there's always that doubt, that fear, and that unbelief. It's, it's, it's really, really, this is kind of crazy when you look at it. It's really insecurity. You are not secure, therefore you put up a front, you put on the mask of pride, you lift it up, you start deceiving yourself, you start hindering your blessing, and you get out of faith. But look at this, the just. The just really means the uprightness, the, the right will and way of God, the just, the upright of heart. See, the, the proud is not upright, but the just, the upright, shall live, how? By his faith. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I'm not smart enough. I'm not cool enough. I'm not strong enough. I don't have enough resources, but God is going to make a way. But God is going to do it. But God will come through. See, the only time we're given permission in the Bible to boast is to boast in the Lord or to boast in our weaknesses. Doggone it. That's the only times. Searching the Bible, looking over these pages, reading it year after year after year, studying it. I mean, I looked. Please know this. I looked. I studied, I researched, I was trying to find a way out of this today. But the only time we're given permission to boast is, number one, to boast in the Lord. Or if we're going to boast in ourselves, I will boast in my infirmity. I'm not cool enough, not smart enough, not nice enough. I'm born in the wrong area at the wrong time, in the wrong place, the wrong way. My goodness, even my dog is ugly. <laughs> now, we have a cute dog. That wasn't meant for us. That was... See, she'll get mad when we get home. If I call my dog ugly, he's cute. Praise God. But see, we're allowed to boast in the Lord, and we're allowed to boast in our infirmity. In other words, it ain't about us. Pride just, just is, it deflects, right? That, 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 that heart of faith says, you know what? It's not even about me. This is about God. You know what? I, I, I'm not really that great, but God is great. I, I can't do it, but God can do it. I don't have enough, but God has it all. I, 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 I'm not wise, but God is the all-wise, all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present God. I, I can't make a way. I can't bust through, but God's going to break through. God's going to make it happen. God will take us there. Can you imagine a nation that believed God? Can you imagine a nation that trusted in their Savior? Can you imagine what America would be like, church? Can you imagine what San Bernardino would be like, church, if we would believe God and live by our faith? Which brings us to the last thing. I don't want to leave you here in pride because there's a way out. Do you know that? Bible gives us a way out. And the way out of pride is humility. In other words, the Bible has a lot of oxymorons in there, little things that shouldn't be but are because that's just the way God made it. God didn't want us thinking too much of ourselves or trying to figure it out and formulate it and make it happen and then say, oh, look what I did, right? 
So God makes everything, kind of, kind of flips the world upside down on us, turns things around. So the way up is down. And the way down is up. You say, Pastor, what on earth does that mean? Here's what it means. If we exalt ourselves in pride, if we lift ourselves up, we know that God is going to bring us low, right? Because the proud are an abomination to the Lord and be, pride comes before a great fall and a haughty spirit before destruction, right? Okay? So we know that the way down, if you want to find yourself humiliated, just go up. Exalt yourself in pride. You will find that at the end of that road is ruin. There is a big cliff that you're going to fall off the end of. But if you really want to go up, then you've got to go down. And that's the conundrum of the word of God. That is the unanswerable question. How does that work? I don't know. God just makes it happen. God just takes something and turns it upside down. See, if we lower ourselves in humility, the Bible promises us that God will lift us up. I want to show you two verses from two different authors in the Bible, okay? Two verses, two different men, both saying the same things. First of all, James chapter 4. Turn there with me. James chapter 4. I want you to remember where this is. So I want you to turn there in your Bible to the book of James, right after the book of Hebrews. You all know where Hebrews is from the Sunday mornings. Right after Hebrews, you'll find the book of James. James, the fourth chapter. Great book. James, the fourth chapter. First of all, verse number six. I want to I just point this out. I don't have this up on the overheads for you, but verse number six, but he give more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Okay? Now, look at verse number 10. Look at what verse number 10 says. Can you read it with me? Here we go. One, two, three. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Isn't that amazing? How many of you remember singing that way back in the day? You guys remember that? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, right? You guys remember that one? Some of you guys that have been around a while, you remember that one, okay? Campfire, right? Guitar, okay? That's a great verse to memorize. Why? Because if you want to go up, look at this. Humble yourselves. What does humble mean? Humble means it's the same word of humiliate, to bring low. It's that word to come under, right? When, when you lower yourself. See, pride lifts self up. Pride says, here I am. Pride says, look at me. Pride says, I can do it. Pride says, it's all about me, myself, and I, right? That's pride. But humility says... I'm going to lift God up. Remember, humility is God exaltation. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Fully trust in, have faith in, depend on God. Lift God up, right? Because who cares if they see me? I'm here for 100 years if I get that, right? 120 if I hold on for dear life, okay? Because that's the maximum amount of time. But really, you start reading the Bible, you find Moses saying 80 years if we have the strength. So we've got a limited amount of time. When you take a look at the millennium and then expand that to eternity, our little time here on the earth is just a twinkling of an eye, here and gone. That's it. That's all you have. And so if while I'm here, if I don't lift up my name, but I lift up his name, look at this. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. God himself will lift you you up. I don't know about you, but I think God can take me higher than I can take myself. Is that right? Okay. That's one verse. Let's take a look at the next verse. You're there in James. Turn over to the next book. First Peter. Excuse me. I'm going to cough for a second. Can you mute me in the sound? <coughs> Good. Thank you. First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, verse number 5. Take a look at it with me. Look at this. Remember, two different men, two different authors in the Bible, both saying the same things in two different letters to the church, okay? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 5 says this, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. In other words, give each other preference. Love one another enough to give of yourself for the betterment of someone else. Don't make it about you. Be submissive to one another, and look at this, and be clothed with humility. You know what that means? Wrap yourself with humility. Do you know that humility is attractive? When you find somebody that's humble where it's not about them, oh my goodness, you just want to hang out with them. 
You ever have a conversation with somebody and they keep turning it around to God? My goodness, that's attractive. That's something that you want to be around. That's something to be desired. Clothe yourself with humility. Why? For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Did we not just read that in the book of James? Okay. Now look at the next verse, verse 6. Therefore, let's read it together on the count of three. One, two, three. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. See, that's not in you time. That's in due time. We would like it to be in you time, right? God, lift me up. God says, no, you need to stay down underneath this hand for a little while longer. Yeah, you need to stay there, child. What we're growing here, I'm shielding you from some attacks of the enemy right now. I'm keeping you from pride. There, there's some fiery darts coming at you. You need to lift up that shield of faith, child, right now, and, and stay underneath the hand because there's protection here. You need to stay here and humble yourself, and at the right time, whoosh, I'll take you up where you need to be. I will lift you up. I myself, that's a promise from Almighty God himself that he will lift you up in due time. If we trust him, we just give it to him. So the way out of pride is humility. Tonight, many of us are seeking a blessing. Many of us are praying to God for things. Many of us are believing God in areas of our life. And for some of us, including myself, it hasn't been happening. Why? Because it's been pride. It's been a hindrance. D.L. Moody in his book, Men of the Bible, said this, there may be some confessions we need to make to be brought into close fellowship with God. I have no doubt that numbers of Christians are hungering and thirsting for a personal blessing and have a great desire to get closer to God if that is the desire of your heart, keep in mind that if there is some obstacle in the way which you can remove, you will not get a blessing until you remove it. We must cooperate with God. If there is any sin in my heart that I am not willing to give up, then I need not pray. Tonight, some of us need to repent of pride. And I'll be the first one to get on my knees before the Lord right here in this pulpit. Confess my sin and repent of pride, humble myself before God. I want to close with this tonight, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 14. Take a look at it with me, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Oftentimes when we talk about praying for our nation, we read this verse. But it's so important that we realize that it's not us lifting up our name. It's not about lifting up Rock Church or lifting up Pastor Dan or Pastor Luke or Pastor Jim and Deborah. Not about us lifting up a, a pulpit platform star. Not about us lifting up a band or a, or a ministry. This is about us lifting up the name of Jesus. Can, can, I, can I just brag on someone else? See, because we can boast in our weaknesses. We can boast in, in others. The Bible gives us permission, right? The Apostle Paul said, I knew a man who was cut up in the third side. I'll brag about that guy, but I won't brag about myself. When it comes to me, I'll brag in my infirmities. But our pastor who founded this church, when he started this church, he said, God, I want to have a church that doesn't know the name of Jim Cobray, but knows the name of Jesus. And that prayer has been answered because there's many times I've heard him say, man, I went in the courtyard, nobody knows who I am. The parties and different things like that. We said, well, pastor, they don't even go to our church. They just came for the party. <laughs> but I really do believe that the Lord has answered that prayer. And I find myself echoing that prayer, not, not to exalt myself in front of you and make you think any better of me, but who cares who knows me on this earth? As long as my wife loves me, my children know the name of Jesus and are proclaiming his name till he comes. As long as there's a church loving people to life, my goodness, who cares who knows me or them or him or her or whoever? All I care is that they know the name of Jesus. Amen. If you want to pray, repent of pride, I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's you do what you need to do before the Lord right now. Father, tonight, we come before you. God, we humble ourselves. Lord, where there's been the desire to be seen. God, where there's been the desire to exalt self, push our thoughts or our ways. God, we as a people repent. 
We just humble ourselves before you, God. Ask for your forgiveness, God. Lord, we pray that you change our hearts. God, we just give them to you. Great Potter, mold us into the image of Jesus. Purify us, cleanse us, God. Lord, we don't want to get caught in the snare of the devil, who himself was lifted up in pride. But God, we want to be like Jesus, who humbled himself even to death on a cross. Humiliating death, public shame for the glory of God. Lord, we make it not about us, we make it about Jesus. And God, we endeavor to live a life that is pleasing to you, God. And we thank you, Father God, for your forgiveness and for your love. We ask for our nation, God. We have been a proud nation. We repent on behalf of our land, God. We humble ourselves under your mighty hand. God, we ask that you heal our land. We ask that you make America and the United States not a byword among the nations, but a blessing. God, that we would not be a curse on people's lips, but that, Father God, we would be the church rising up in this nation that would send forth missionaries, that would send forth relief and aid, send forth the wisdom of God and the way of God and be a blessing to the nations, hastening your return. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said. Amen. Amen. Well, come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise if you got something for the word of the Lord tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. And we've had quite a night tonight. And uh, before we... Conclude, I just want to make sure that everybody's right with God before you leave. So I'm going to ask everybody, please remain seated during this time. The ushers are still doing their job. So we're just going to let them complete what they're doing. And as they do, just give me a couple more minutes of your attention, and then we'll let you go. It's been a great night tonight. I want to thank you guys for your time and your attention. And I know that may have been more of an Omid message than an Amen message, but I really do believe that you got something from the Word of the Lord. Now tonight, let's talk about your eternal life. It would be a tragedy if we came into this place and prayed and sang and laughed and had such a good time in the Word of the Lord. Some of us cried before the Lord tonight. Your heart was touched. It would be a tragedy if we did all that and you walked out of this place, your heart wasn't right with God. You ended your life here on the earth. You died by no fault of your own. It would be a tragedy if that happened and you didn't end up in heaven, but you ended up in hell. Now, sometimes people say they don't believe in hell, but, you know, you can't just ignore something and it goes away. It doesn't work like that. Bury your head in the sand and not expect the wind to touch you. It's not going to happen. The Bible speaks of hell, Old and New Testament. Jesus himself talked about hell, so it's a very real place. You're not going to get out of there by simply ignoring it. You're going to have to face the reality of it. Tonight, I want to make sure that you don't end up there. In fact, God doesn't want you there either. The Bible says that he grieves when people die and go to hell. God is not pleased. He takes no pleasure in the death of the unrighteous, the Bible says. And therefore, God doesn't want you to go to hell. Don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried it out in his son Jesus, don't you think if he did all that going to the cross that he would let us know how to get to heaven? Well, he does in his word. Now, sometimes people think, well, all roads lead to heaven, don't they? Just do whatever you want and you'll end up there because God made a way. Yeah, God made a way, but that doesn't include every way. You think that God would just let you do whatever you want to do and this church can do what they want to do and that place can do what they want to do and everybody's going to end up there? No. Jesus said the road is narrow and there are few who find it. And tonight, I want to tell you about God's way because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What's that mean? That means it's God's heaven and you're going to have to get there God's way. Can't get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. Got to get there God's way. God has revealed to us in his word how to get to heaven. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. That's how to get to heaven, plain and simple. Now, sometimes people say, well, I've heard about that in movies and television and books and read about it on the internet. It's weird and I don't want it, you know. Well, listen, let's not let society and movie and books and television and the internet decide for us what we're going to do. Let's let the word of God determine that for our lives. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Does it mean that you were raised in church? No. Can't be raised in church and that gets you into heaven. Does it mean that you're a good person and you do a lot of good works throughout your life and maybe your good outweighs your bad? No, nowhere in the Bible does it say your good works will get you into heaven. In fact, the Bible says if you're trusting in your goodness to get you into heaven, it's like filthy rags compared to God's goodness. It means it's going to get thrown out. It's not going to make it. Does, does being born again mean that you attend church and, you know, carry a Bible? No, no, it doesn't mean that at all. 
can't just sit in a church service, call yourself a Christian, and that makes you a Christian. That's like saying you could go to your garage, sit in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. Not going to work. Can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Well, wait, does being born again mean getting involved in church, helping out, singing in the choir, teaching in the Bible classes, getting a membership card? Doesn't church involvement mean I get to go to heaven? Well, no, nowhere in the Bible does it say that your church involvement gets you into heaven. Check it out. It's not there. Can't do enough to get yourself into heaven. Sometimes people say, well, wait a second. Does being born again mean that I know God and I know who Jesus is and I can quote some scriptures, celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of my life? Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian headed for heaven? Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that knowing who God is, having mental assent towards God gets you into heaven? It doesn't work like that. In fact, if you read your Bible, you'd know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and they tremble. They're not going to make it. If you'd read your Bible, you know the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth. And that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up here at me for a second. Look up here. This is not about what you have in your head, but rather this is about your heart. What does being born again really mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. Have you humbled yourself to do it God's way, giving him control? all of your heart, giving him all of your life. Not only making him savior, but making him Lord of all. Lord means boss. If you haven't yet done that, maybe you prayed a prayer at one time, but listen, it's not about magical abracadabra words. Poof, now you're a Christian. This is about God looking at your heart, seeing if your life will follow that confession. Tonight, have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? If not, I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. But in a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Then you say, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. Did you just say you're going to point at me and count? I might be embarrassed if you do that. Uh-huh, you might be. Let's push past that tonight. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. And yet the devil thinks you're dumb enough to, and that's why he's trying to talk you out of it right now. Flesh is trying to hold you back. Listen, let's push past that tonight. Let's go for God, humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God. God, I need you. God, I can't save myself. God, I can't do enough. God, I, I, I just want to make you Lord and Savior of my life. Give you all my heart. Give you all my life. It's all or nothing with God. Let me prove it to you in the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. He says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic, gross words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's lukewarm mean? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down. A little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. Tonight, you need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Tonight, come on, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, giving him all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get your hand up and make a right relationship with God, acknowledging your need for Jesus. Count to three, pop my hands together, wherever you're at, all across this auditorium, back in the family rooms. If you're watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or online, you can raise your hand right where you're at. God is watching. Then click the button that says respond to God or go to our homepage and click the button that says respond to God. And someone will lead you in a prayer right where you're at. Count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five. God bless you guys. Where else tonight that I haven't seen yet? Five, where else up top? Oh, thank you, six. Got you. God bless you over there. Six, wise people already on this side. Anybody else real quick? Come on, there's six. over. I got you already. Thank you. You can put your hand down. God bless you. Seven, got you right there. Thank you up on top. Who else tonight? About seven wise people saying, yeah, I need to give God all my heart. I need to give God all my life. Anybody else real quick? I'm looking to the sides because I haven't seen anybody. There's, thank you. There's eight. Knew you were over there, man. Anybody else real quick? Come on, I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. Anybody else real quick? Thank you, number nine. Oh, if there's nine. Don't you know there's a number 10 out there? Where you at, number 10? Come on, you're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, yeah, you should go for it. Come on, number 10, where you at? 
Where are you at? Just pop it up when I'm looking your direction. Anybody else real quick? Number 10. Ah, got you right over there, number 10. Come on, let's live, give the Lord a great big praise tonight. 10 wise people. All right, all 10 of you, or if you're number 11, number 12, or number 13, hey, talking to you too. Even if you didn't raise your hand, here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand, give a clap, and a shout. Elijah's going to lead us in a song. As he sings that song, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies here tonight. Can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand. You come right now. Just get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on. I believe. For the family rooms, you can bring your children. Come on down. Jesus, I belong to you. They're coming. They're coming. The reason that I live. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. Jesus, I believe in you. All right, come on down. Even if you didn't raise your hand, you can come too. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come to you. This is your time. This is your moment. Anybody else, if you need to come, you just come right now. Come on down. All right, hey, you guys up front. Look up here at me. Put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, all right? Came to give God all your heart. Came to give God all of your life. This is the best decision of your life right here, right? And I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. See this guy waving at you over here in the black coat? This is Pastor Joel. Really good guy. Nothing weird is going to go on right now, okay? I'm going to let you know what he's going to do in advance so that you're not scared, kind of wondering, oh, what are they doing with me now, you know? Here, here's what he's going to do. Three things. Number one, lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Prayer is just talking to God. You're going to give God all your heart, going to give God all your life. You're going to be born again just like you raised your hand and said you wanted to be. Then he's going to give you some free information, some free literature that our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. And finally, he's going to give you what we call a spiritual personal trainer you say a spiritual what a personal trainer basically let me break it down to you like this it's a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the lord it's easy it's free he'll tell you how it works and then i'll let you come right back out okay now listen i'm gonna make a promise to you guys you guys ready here's the promise give us one year of your life here at this church one year sitting under the teaching consistently okay that means on a regular basis get into church one time two times Hey, be radical three, four times a week, man. We're here 11 church services just for you guys, all right? Making it happen for you guys. At the end of that year and for the rest of your life, the blessings of God will just overwhelm you. You'll say, I never knew it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? All right. That's my promise to you guys, okay? You guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.